Okay. Good morning. Good morning. And, uh, nice to see you this morning. My name is Evan Weiner, and uh, I've been here before. My background is journalism. And uh, next week, April 17th, is uh, in Israel. It's uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day, uh, being commemorated in the United States on April the 18th. And how did we get there? How did we get to where we ended up in 1939 and subsequently 84 years later? Uh, Europe goes to war in 1939. Uh, Adolf Hitler, no introduction needed there. 20,000 Nazis rally at Madison Square Garden in February. Uh, Father Coughlin, the uh, originator of hate radio or propaganda radio in the United States, is at his height in 1939. Spanish Civil War ends. There are four wars in 1939. This is one of them. Uh, Germany invading Poland is another one. There's one in uh, China and there's uh, one in Finland. There are four wars. Middle East, a failure. The Arab Revolt, England doesn't know really what to do. Uh, the atomic bomb, 1939 is the first time that the atomic bomb would come up, and that, of course, is Albert Einstein. Anybody here to, been to the New York World's Fair or went to New York World's Fair in 1939? You went there? Were you on TV? Were you on TV there? No, no, because uh, there were some people uh, who um, went there who've told me over the years that uh, were pulled out of line and they were actually on TV at the experimental television station at the World's Fair. You were about it? Well, you might have been there. Channel 1, WNBT TV or W2X uh, BS TV uh, was on at that point. Uh, Channel 1, WNBT eventually. Gone with the Wind. How many of you have watched Gone with the Wind over the years? You like the movie? Love it. Love it? That was released in 1939. Marian Anderson sung at the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, Wizard of Oz. How many of you uh, were off to see the wizard, the wonderful Wizard of Oz? You like Lovick? Yeah. You know when it came out, it was a dud. It was an absolute dud when it came out. Uh, Lou Gehrig retired. Uh, Europe goes to war. Second time in 25 years that Europe goes to war. Years of international tension and aggressive expansion by fascist Italy and Nazi Germany culminated in the German invasion of Poland on September the 1st. Britain and France declared war on Germany two days later. Uh, the decisions, why did Europe go to war? Well, the decisions reflected the ambitions, the rivalries, the fears, the anxieties that developed in the two decades that followed the end of World War I. You could say, actually, World War II was chapter two to a book of wars in the world at that point. European powers were willing to go to war to extend or protect what each nation saw in dramatically different ways as, the, as matters of vital interest, great power status, international prestige, and national survival. Kaiser Wilhelm, World War I, with those helmets that had the points at the top. Uh, First World War and its subsequent peace settlements gave rise to new ambitions, new rivalries, new tensions. People had high expectations that the post-war peace settlement would create a new world order. A phrase that was uttered a week ago after a meeting between the Russian leaders and the Chinese leaders about the need for a new world order following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That's, uh, that phrase, that three-word three phrase, is used around a lot. New world order, sometimes it means communist, sometimes it means internationalist, whatever it is. But it, uh, it's been a phrase that was used a lot, repeatedly, and just used last week. And the slaughter of the First World War would never be repeated. Treaty of Versailles, France, and there's Woodrow Wilson at the end, the American president. And he's meeting with uh, David Lloyd George of Great Britain and the material Orlando of Italy. He 
George Clemenceau of France. They're the winners, and they get to divvy up Europe, and they get to uh, dictate the terms of the treaty. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles is signed in June of 1919, and among other things, it creates a League of Nations intended to uh, promote peace and prevent war. But uh, the treaty is rather uneasy. Um, Britain and uh, America and France and Italy want to pursue their own interests after World War I. Germany was forced to surrender territory and uh, pay for the war's damage because the Americans were the victors. They got to uh, dictate the terms along with the Brits. Um, well, they wanted an awful lot out of Germany. And some people thought that maybe they wanted way too much out of Germany, and they were very vindictive. And the treaty would cause immediate outrage and lasting bitterness in Germany. So the seeds of the next war are planted. There's an irony of all this, because uh, Germany comes out of this in an extremely strong strategic position. Poland's created. Czechoslovakia is created, the Baltic states, and that puts a buffer between Germany and its traditional rival, Soviet Union or Russia. And that also means that a bunch of weak countries are created on the eastern border, and their geography is not very easy to defend. So Germany, in spite of all this, ends the war with weak states on its eastern border which they would eventually invade. Well, the Treaty of Lausanne in Switzerland, 1923, ends World War I officially. It's a treaty signed by France and Britain, Italy, Japan, Greece, Romania, and the new Republic of Turkey. So why did Hitler hate the Jews? Why did he have such hatred? Well, it may have been because of the big lie or the big myth that was spread, the big lie. Uh, during World War I, Adolf Hitler was just a soldier in the German army. That's all he was. He was an obscure guy who really was just, you know, cannon fodder, basically. Uh, but he and his fellow German soldiers couldn't believe that the German Empire was defeated. They couldn't have lost, they were better. The German command, the heads of the army, the other uh, military forces in Japan said, uh, rather Germany said, nah, we didn't lose on the battlefield. No, we didn't lose on the battlefield at all. We were betrayed. Who betrayed them? Who betrayed them? The big myth, the big lie. It was called then a stab in the back. It was the big lie or the big myth. Uh, Hitler bought into the myth. Jews and communists, and somehow Jews were equated to communism through Karl Marx, who wasn't Jewish, Jewish heritage, uh, had betrayed Germany. And uh, that brought a left-wing government to power that didn't really care. They just wanted to uh, acquiesce to anything that uh, the Brits or the French wanted and the Americans. By 1923, this guy is in jail. And he writes this book in jail called My Struggle, in English, My Kampf. Uh, it's his memoirs. Memoirs. I mean, this, this guy is, you know, he's a nobody, but he's got memoirs. And he predicted a general European war would result in the extermination of the Jewish race in Germany. That was 100 years ago. So why did Hitler hate Jews? Here he is, along with his fellow Nazis. Uh, he blamed Jews for the defeat. And he creates an enemy, a stereotypical enemy. In the 1920s and the 1930s, Germany was an economic mess. But according to Hitler and his cohorts, if we get rid of all the Jews in Germany, we'll be fine. We just got to get rid of all of them. Just let's exile them. Let's just throw them out of the country. The political message and the promise to make Germany economically strong again one hit the elections in 1932. Actually, he was not in charge of Germany. This guy was Paul von Hindenburg. He basically handed Germany to Hitler. 
Uh, January 30th, 1933, uh, the president, Paul von Hindenburg, names Adolf Hitler leader or Führer of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the Nazi Party, as Chancellor of Germany. Hitler's plan was embraced by most of the German population. Do away with politics, make Germany a powerful, united, one-party state. And Hitler begins to look at what he can get away with. And he starts with the Jews, taking businesses away, taking their places of uh, where they live away, and educational opportunities away, and then also throwing Jews out of the German sports organizations. By 1935, he decides he's going to see how far he can get with the international community. They tell him, you cannot reconstitute your army. What are you telling that to me? I don't care what you say. He reinstitutes the Luftwaffe. Uh, the German Air Force, direct violation of the Treaty of Versailles. Everybody stands on, well, they, they, they sit on their hands. They don't do it. You probably don't know this guy's name. His name is Ernest Jenke, and he is a member of the International Olympic Committee as a delegate. He's also the former secret, Assistant Secretary of War, uh, rather, Secretary of the Navy. Uh, the United States. And he's getting reports, as a former secretary does, uh, even an assistant secretary, and he's got family that lives in Germany. So there he's getting these reports, and they're not very good. He was an American International Olympic Committee delegate, and he expressed outrage what, with the reports that was happening within Hitler's Germany. And on November 25th, 1935, he sends a letter to the International Olympic Committee President, Count Henri Latour Belay, uh, rather, uh, Henri Belay Latour, floating the initial idea of an American boycott of the 1936 Summer Games in Berlin. Germany gets both the uh, Winter Olympics and the Summer Olympics in 1936. Winter Olympics would be near Munich. And the reason why they get it, 1931, let's bring Germany back into the family of countries. Hitler isn't on the scene at this point. Uh, Jackie's letter is simple. Neither Americans nor representatives of other countries can take part in the games in Nazi Germany without at least acquiescing to the contempt of the Nazis for fair play and their sordid exploitation of the games. The letter seems to go unnoticed. Well, like I said, former assistant secretary for the United States Navy, German descent, uh, he knows what's going on, and by July 1936, he is thrown out of that exclusive club of International Olympic Committee delegates and replaced by a racist, along with an anti-Semite by the name of Avery Brundage. Uh, anybody go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C.? You have. You probably missed this little tribute that he was given at uh, the Holocaust Museum because it's only like this by this, just a little saying about him. Judge Jeremiah Mahoney, he's Catholic, he's from New York. He's the head of the Amateur Athletic Union, the people who choose the athletes, or in those days choose the athletes to be on the Olympic team. Uh, and Mahoney starts talking about why we need to boycott Germany in the Olympics. 1933, Ari Arian's only policy was uh, instituted in all German athletic organizations. Non-Aryans, Jews or individuals with Jewish parents, or Romans or gypsies, were systematically excluded from German sports facilities and associations. They included Daniel Preen, who is a, a world-class tennis player on Germany's, uh, Germany's Davis Cup team. Included the light heavyweight boxing champion of the world, Eric Siegel. Uh, he also included a woman by the name of Gretel Bergman, who is the best athlete in Western. Oh, okay, yeah, they won, okay. In, in Western Europe. Uh, I happened to interview Gretel Bergman in 1993. Uh, the, 1936, the, the 1936 Olympics had three prominent Jews who
who did not, who did not participate. So Marley Glickman, I worked with back in 1988. Uh, Sam Stoller, I knew, he ran the Melrose Games uh, for at Madison Square Garden. And Gretel Berkman, who I interviewed in 1990. And um, I asked Gretel Berkman about being thrown out of the German sports organizations. This is 1993, 60 years later. She's a woman in her late 70s at that point. And she said she went on. She went to England. She trained for the 1936 Olympics, even though she knew she was never going to be on the German team. They called her back, and then they told her two weeks before the Olympics, you're not going to be on the team. But she said, you have to understand, everything we had, they took away from us. Everything they had. We had jobs. We had apartments. We had education. We were part of Everything's taken away. Everything. But I had to give my people a glimmer of hope because we were hopeless. We were absolutely hopeless. So I wanted to give them a glimmer of hope. I knew I was never going to be on the team. There's an HBO special that came out in 2004 called Hitler's On. One hour about Gretel Bergman, Martha Lambert of the United States. Uh, she married her uh, boyfriend, who was uh, also ex who they fled from Germany in 1937. Dr. Bruno Lambert. Um, anyway, back to Mahoney. There's no room for discrimination on the grounds of race, color, or creed in the Olympics. The AAU voted in 1933 to accept an invitation to compete at Berlin in 1936, providing that Germany pledged there would be no discrimination against Jewish athletes. If that pledge is not kept, I personally do not see why we should compete. Franklin Roosevelt sat on his hands. In fact, he encouraged the American team to go to Berlin because they're athletes, and this is politics. One of those athletes who agreed with him was Marty Glickman, who I worked with as part of his broadcast school in 1988. And Marty told me, me and Sam, his friend Sam Stoller, both from New York, two Jews from New York, they're going to run in the 4 by 100 meter relay in Berlin. And they are going to win that gold medal. They're going to win that gold medal. They're going to be in the podium, and they're going to shove that gold medal right to the Fuhrer's face, showing him what Jews can do from New York. Well, they never got the opportunity. Avery Brundage grounded him, along with coach Dean Cromwell. Marty said it was anti-Semitism. Sam was a quiet guy by nature. Didn't say very much about anything. Uh, but he was humiliated. Uh, but uh, the athletes would go, and Marty said it was the right decision. About seven Jewish athletes uh, from the United States went to Berlin. For the first time in the history of the modern Olympics, people in the United States and Europe called for a boycott of the Olympics because of what would later become known as human rights abuses. And this is where Avery Brundage led the American team, right into the stadium in Berlin with the Heil Hitler salutes. Brundage had assurances from the Fuhrer, oh, it's got a, no problem, we're going to be able to compete, not a problem in the world. Brundage said, certain Jews must understand they cannot use these games as a weapon in their boycott against the Nazis. He also labeled the anti-Olympic campaign as a Jewish communist conspiracy. Wrong. It was led by Mahoney, who was a Catholic. His supporters included the New York governor, Al Smith, who was a Catholic. Massachusetts governor, James Curley, who was a Catholic. Certainly, uh, uh, Jenke uh, was, was of German descent. Uh, some American newspapers called Avery Brundage a Nazi stooge. That was the nicest thing that you can say about him. Marty Glickman used to say of Avery Brundage, may he rot in the seventh ring of hell. The games go on, there they are, with the Nazi flag. In August 1936, the Nazi regime tried to camouflage, uh, camouflage its uh, violent, racist past policies while it hosted the Summer Olympics. Most anti-Jewish signs were temporarily removed and newspapers toned down their harsh rhetoric. It was all an illusion, just an illusion. The Berlin Games presented to foreign spectators and journalists with a false image of a peaceful, tolerant Germany. Well, Adolf Hitler has his victory. 
It's a propaganda coup. Not only home in Germany, but around the world. They've accepted Adolf Hitler. 49 nations sent teams to Germany and it legitimized the Hitler regime. There's no stopping him now. He knows the world is not going to do anything. Kristallnacht, November 1938, November 1910. Uh, Nazi leaders unleashed a series of pogroms uh, against the Jewish population in Germany and recently incorporated territories like Czechoslovakia. We'll get into that in a minute. The night came to be called Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, because of the shattered glass that littered the streets after the vandalism and destruction of Jewish-owned businesses, synagogues, and homes. But Neville Chamberlain, he is the Prime Minister of uh, England, and of course there is Adolf Hitler, and he's looking to avoid World War II, or at least the European War. So uh, he's best known for the Munich Agreement of 1938, which ceded parts of Czechoslovakia to Hitler. Unbeknownst to the leaders of Czechoslovakia, hey, Hitler's in charge now. It's okay. I said it's okay, said Neville Chamberlain. Here you go. Right on the flat. Uh, Chamberlain uh, flew to Berlin on September 15, 1938, in an attempt to secure the peace. Uh, Czechoslovakian leader said, hey, what are you doing? And the great appeaser, Chamberlain, the great appeaser, eh, don't worry about it. Oh, by the way, even if you worried about it, we ain't doing nothing about it. You're on your own, boys. Uh, the deal is done, September 3rd. Uh, Chamberlain thought, this, we've averted the war. Proclaimed peace for our time to a crowd upon his arrival in well, 1939. We finally get to 1939. It has been six years since Hitler has become the chancellor. He has thumbed his, his nose at, uh, at the world. The world hasn't done a thing to stop him. And it's time for the Jewish solution. June 24th, Adolf Hitler's second in command of Führer, as Führer of the German Reich and people. Hermann Goring authorizes the SS, the security police, and SD chief Reinhard Hendrick to coordinate solutions for the forced immigration of Jews from the greater German Reich and establish a central office for Jewish immigration in Berlin. Sounds great. Just get out of here. They let people out in 1937 only with 10 bucks in their pocket. But get out. So the problem in 1939 was nobody wanted the Jews. Nobody wanted the Jews, particularly American and England. There's Hitler at 39. On January 30th, Hitler declares that in the event of another world war for which he intended to hold international financial jewelry responsible, there would be no Bolshevikization of the earth and with the victory of Jewry, but rather the annihilation of the Jewish race. Hitler is on the march, or as Mel Brooks said in the producers, Hitler is on tour. And there is nobody stopping him, absolutely nobody stopping him. Slovakia declares its independence from the Czechoslovak state on March 14th. The German troops go into the remaining part of Czechoslovakia, occupying the Czech provinces, establishing the protectorate of Bohemia and Bavaria. Um, well, here's a guy reading the headlines of all the papers in London, and they basically say the same thing, conscription. We are going to get everybody over the age of 20. We're going to throw them into the army because we're preparing for war. April 27, it's a dramatic, dramatic departure. Britain is preparing for war. Well, Hitler goes looking for allies. And he finds one in Benito Mussolini. It's the Pact of Steel, or the Pact of Friendship and Alliance between Germany and Italy. It is a political and military agreement. It is signed on May 22nd, 1939. Now remember I said nobody wanted the Jews. Anybody here remember the plight of the St. Louis? The ship. Nobody? Yeah. Yeah, you do? Okay. St. Louis. Bunch of Jews fleeing Germany out of Hamburg, and they're going to Cuba, and they think they're going to be okay going to Cuba. Between May 13th, June 17th, 
900 refugees aboard the St. Louis. Most of them are Jews. They're leaving Hamburg for Cuba. Uh, they're hoping to receive entry visas to the United States. Cuba and the United States would refuse to accept the refugees, forcing them to return to Europe. Well, why? Why did the United States uh, take them? Well, they didn't have the visas. Canada didn't take them. They didn't have the visas. Uh, the St. Louis passengers ended up uh, in Western Europe and Belgium, uh, never returned to Nazi Germany, but eventually, out of the 900, 254 of them would be killed in the Holocaust. And there is the St. Louis uh, being rejected in one of the ports it went to. The U.S. government didn't allow the passengers to land since they didn't have the proper U.S. Uh, immigration visas and there was no security screening. The American president, Franklin Roosevelt, totally ignored that. Totally ignored that. But uh, you've got to go back to 1924 to understand why St. Louis ended up in Belgium. It's the 1924 Immigration Act, which was a culmination of about a three-year campaign by certain senators to place quotas on immigrants coming to the United States. If you're from Scandinavia, no quotas. From England, no quotas. Eastern Europe, quotas. Uh, and it didn't extend just to Jews. It was Italians, it was Greeks, and it was others from uh, Eastern Europe. Didn't want them here. Also, nobody from China or Japan or Asia. Doors slammed absolutely shut in their faces. Uh, that was the 1924 Immigration Act. 1933, similar act in Canada. Uh, Jews would be able to go to Halifax, uh, Pier 21 in Halifax. That ends in 1933. The Jews have nowhere to go. Uh, oh, New York, the German-American boy. I give a lot of talks in New Jersey, in the Newark area, down in Union and uh, Springfield and uh, Westfield and Livingston and uh, uh, Milburn. And uh, those are heavily Jewish populated areas. And it seems like all the Jews from Newark just pick themselves up with their synagogue and just landed in Union or, or uh, Livingston or Springfield, one of those towns. And uh, I've been doing talks for over 25 years. And uh, the old timers, going back 25 years ago, told me there were bug meetings in our East Orange, New Jersey, and in Glen Rock, New Jersey, and Malvern, uh, now on Long Island. Nobody's ever told me about bug meetings in Connecticut. Uh, I'm sure there were. Uh, the German-American Book was an organization of ethnic Germans living in the United States, pro-Nazis. Uh, their program included anti-Semitism, anti-communist sentiments, and the demand that the United States remain neutral in the, in the approaching European uh, conflict. Uh, this is a poster, Madison Square Garden, February 20th, 1939. Pro-American rally from ethnic Germans. Uh, mass demonstration for true Americanism. Well, who's true Americanism? Theirs? The Germans? Uh, at Madison Square Garden. The German Bund activities uh, led to fights in the streets with other groups like the Jewish war veterans of World War I. But they all come out on February 20th, 8th Avenue and 52nd Street in Manhattan. 20,000 Nazis are there. The rights uh, to proclaim, the rights of white Gentiles, the true patriots, Madison Square Garden crowd of 20,000, booed Franklin Roosevelt, chanted Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler. But that was their undoing because this guy, Fritz Kuhn, the American government decided to take a closer look at his finances. Uh, Fritz Kuhn, in public opinion polls, the leader of the Bund, uh, was seen as the leading anti-Semite uh, uh, in the country. Uh, how many people were a member of the Bund? Nobody knows. They think it's 25,000 due-paying members, of which 8,000 of them have uniforms. They're stormtroopers in the United States out of that group. But uh, the Roosevelt administration decides we want to take a look at the finances. And they do. They raid the headquarters in the Yorkville section, uh, east side of Manhattan, around 82nd Street, 2nd Avenue. And uh, they have a question about this $14,000 that that's unaccounted for, totally unaccounted for. 
Well, they find out that uh, Kuhn spent the money on his mistress and other expenses. They arrest him. He's charged with embezzlement. And in December 1939, he ends up at Sing Sing. This is the originator of hate radio in the United States, a Canadian, Canadian by the name of Father Charles Copper. He was born in Hamilton, Ontario, uh, and uh, ended up in the Detroit area at, uh, at the church. Um, he was um, a radio celebrity as well. As a friend of mine, Don Fear, who ran the Baseball Players Association, once said, Americans dote on celebrity. They dote on celebrity. And he was a celebrity uh, on WGR uh, radio in Detroit and around the country. And uh, he was based in Royal Oak, Michigan, which is an ironic place for me because I do Zoom talks for the library in Royal Oak, Michigan. The sermons were on Sunday night. Uh, his was a populist, anti-communist, anti-Semitic uh, rant. At the peak of his popularity, though, he had 40 million followers in a country of about 130 million. So he had more, about a third of the country that listened to him. Uh, he linked Jews to the creation of uh, and spread of communism. He hated communism. And uh, he used literary and uh, re religious references to spread anti-Semitic stereotypes. Uh, here he is. He's in Royal Oak. And there's another guy in the Detroit area by the name of Henry Ford, who published the Dearborn Independent, who also taught the about the protocols of the elders of, the, of Zionism. Uh, this is his magazine. It's called Social Justice, founded in 1936 by Father Coughlin. And uh, here's a February 27, 1939 issue, The Jewish Question, by, Do by Dr. S.J.S. Uh, although it was proven to be a hoax, uh, he published the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, an anti-Semitic pamphlet, with evidence that there was an international Jewish conspiracy to control the world. Second guy in the Detroit area who did that, Henry Ford being the first, and that was in uh, multiple issues of social justice in 1938. After World War II began in September of 39, he told his followers, Oppose any of the loosening of the immigration law from 1924, which was as tight as could be, and protest any American involvement in the war. After all, Hitler's going to win the war. So, uh, meanwhile, Hitler and Stalin come up with this deal, and this is the deal that breaks the dam and starts World War II. Uh, it was called the Nazi Soviet Non Aggression Pact, signed on August 23rd along with a secret protocol that left Hitler free to attack Poland without risking war with the Soviet Union and divide Europe into a German sphere and into a Soviet influence, influential sphere. Uh, there's Mussolini and Hitler. Uh, on August 25th, as a reaction to the Nazi-Soviet pact, Britain and Poland enter into a military alliance. Now, the Brits still hope that they could have Avoid the war. Uh, and for the next six days, uh, there were frantic attempts to reach a settlement. And Mussolini said, hey, Adolf, you're my butt, but you know what? You go to war, count me out. We're not in. So Mussolini says, uh, I'm out of here. Uh, but the war starts on September 1st. On September 3rd, the English Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, has an announcement. At 11.15 a.m. on the BBC, we're off to war. The Brits had given the Germans 48 hours to get out of Poland. They did it. At 11 o'clock, the war is on. And for the second time in 25 years, Britain is out of war. Mr. Chamberlain goes to war. Germany represented a direct threat to British security and the security of its empire. Accepting German domination of Europe had grave implications for British status and survival. Britain wins war in 1939 to defend the balance of power in Europe and safeguard Britain's position in the world. So where is the United States? Where is the United States? It's on the sideline. American isolationism. Uh, this is from 1940, because I got Dunkirk in there, which was a battle in 1940. But sentiment re remains the same. I did raise my boy to die for Britain. 
That one I don't get. Benedict Arnold tried the treason. What was treason? What was treason? Unless that was somebody from the German American Boom, which was out of business by that point. Uh, the, why the American isolationism? The Neutrality Act of 1935. Americans couldn't export arms and ammunition to any foreign nation at war. 1937, the New Neutrality Act prohibited Americans from traveling on ships owned by any belligerent nation and declared that American-owned ships could not carry any arms intended for war zones. In 1938, war ended on November 11th, 1918, World War I. Uh, 20 years after World War I had ended, 70% of Americans all believed that the United States' participation in that war was a mistake. Germany invades Poland. Uh, the invasion, September 1st, was followed two days later by England and France declaring war on Germany and Italy. America is unmoved. The war in Europe wasn't called the Second War yet. The Second World War yet it was simply known as the Emergency. Americans pulled immediately after the war began, overwhelmingly hoped for the defeat of Germany, but 90% of Americans said, let's not get involved in the war. The majority said, we're not even going to fight, even if Nazi Germany defeated Great Britain and France. Roosevelt has his eye on another war that's taking place that was a little more important to him. It was in Asia and it was between Japan and China, Chiang Kai-shek. This war actually starts in 1931, but the Chinese start to really resist in 1937. Roosevelt's keeping a close eye on Japan. He's very wary about what Japan is doing to China, because Japan is a, or rather China, is a close American ally. George Elser wanted to kill Hitler, and he came within 12 minutes of killing Adolf Hitler. It's November 8th, 16th anniversary of Hitler's beer hall push. A bomb explodes just after Hitler finishes giving a speech. He's unmarked. It's only 12 minutes since Hitler left the uh, hall when the bomb explodes. It's embedded in a uh, 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 pillow behind the uh, speaker's platform. Seven people were killed, 63 wounded. Hitler is far away from this at this point. The third war that I'm going to talk about it is uh, or the fourth, uh, third war is uh, Finland in the Soviet Union. November 30th, following a series of ultimatums and failed negotiations, the Soviet Red Army launched an invasion of Finland with a half million troops. What the Soviets wanted? part of Finland so they could set up military bases. The fourth war is the end of the Spanish Civil War. Uh, that began in July 1936. A rebel coup led by Francisco Franco uh, takes place against the elected Republicans by the military supported nationalists. Nationalists, their support comes from Italy and Germany and the Republicans supported by the Soviet Union. And there is Franco walking there. The country of Spain split in half by the two opposing sides. In 1937, the nationalists gained control of many northern provinces. Uh, the nationalists kept pushing the north, uh, or north, uh, and much of the Republican army fled uh, by the end of 1938 into France. The end is near, Franco again. Franco was appointed head of the nationalist army and chief of staff late 1936. By November 1938, the Nationalist forces made it to outside Madrid and began the siege of the capital. On March 28th, the Nationalists captured Madrid. Franco announced the Nationalist victory on April Fool's Day, April Fool's Day. There were many atrocities committed by both sides. Uh, executions and death squads were rampant, and those who showed opposition to the cause on either side were killed. The estimated death toll about a half million people and about a half million floods of space. Meanwhile, with all this going on, there's also the Middle East. The Middle East is still a powder keg. It has been since 1917, since the Balfour Declaration, when England decided, you know what, uh, we'll give everything to everybody in the Middle East, which they couldn't do. 
Uh, 22 years later, they come up with a white paper uh, issued by the British government about the 1939, 36 and 39 Arab revolt in Palestine. Call for immigration quotas for Jews. Again, nobody wants them. For Palestine, restrictions on settlements and land sales to Jews, and constitutional measures that would lead to a single state under Arab majority rule with provisions to protect the rights of the Jewish minority. With that, the Israelis begin terrorist tactics against the Brits. The atomic bomb. And who better to look, deliver a message about the atomic bomb by than this guy, Albert Einstein? It's early 1939, and two German scientists, Otto Hahn and Fritz Straussmann, discovered fission. And around the world, they said, hey, wait a minute, they have the ingredients for an atomic bomb. Among those concerned was the physicist, Leo Zillard. And he gets in touch with Edward Teller and Eugene Wigner, fellow scientists, and what are we going to do? Well, we know. We'll tell Albert Einstein and have him talk about the threat of a Jewish bomb. Uh, soon afterwards, Zillard spoke with Alexander Sachs, an economist and a friend of Franklin Roosevelt. Sachs said, send him that letter. He gets the letter and becomes concerned. Uh, and he establishes an advisory uranium committee, which would lead eventually to the Manhattan Project. Hollywood begins to take notice of Nazis. Confessions of a Nazi spy, starring Emanuel Goldberg. You know him better as Edward G. Robinson. Produced by the Warner Brothers. Jewish studio heads. Uh, people treaded lightly in Hollywood because Europe was a pretty big market and a good market for them to make money. But by 1939, all bets are off. Uh, Confessions of a Nazi Spy was an American spy political thriller, thriller uh, directed by Anatoly Litvick from Warner Brothers. First explicitly anti-Nazi film to be produced by a major Hollywood studio released in May a few months before the start of World War II. How uh, many were you at the World's Fair? You were in there? What year? 39. No, 39? Well, there it is, the World's Fair. Uh, and Franklin Roosevelt was there. And he opened up the World's Fair on April 30th, 1939, and he was on television. Uh, about 1,000 visitors were able to line up around those little, little TVs. About five per television set. There were 200 set up throughout the fair. FDR is the first president to ever be, give a speech that's broadcast on television. By the way, the first commercial TV, Nazi Germany, 1935. But so few people bought TVs, they gave up because TVs were too expensive and nobody was particularly interested. And if you went into a pavilion, there was the TV. And sometimes, if you were a kid, they pulled you out of the line, told your parents, uh, we want you on TV. And uh, I had one man tell me that about five years ago. He said, my mother went back there to make sure everything was OK. Then she went back to where she was in line, and she saw her 12-year-old son on TV. RCA introduced television to the American public at the World's Fair. Before the fair, there was a brochure that was uh, given to dealers to explain TV. Uh, then NBC would start regularly scheduled broadcasts after, opening, uh, after the opening ceremonies of WNBT Channel 1 and W2XBS. There were about 400 televisions scattered through the New York City area. What television would mean to you? This is the brochure. You can watch a baseball game, watch a boxing match, listen to the opera. You're never going to leave your living room again because everything is going to be right there. Walt Disney was one of the, the pioneers of early TV, both in England and the United States. Now, let, let's play pretend here. I know there was a show called Let's Play Pretend once. And uh, you're all kids in 1939. It's May of 1939. You all have TVs. And you hear that a cartoon is going to be on TV. It's going to be a Disney cartoon. So who do you think you're going to see on that cartoon? the Disney characters. Minnie Mouse? Donald Duck? Mickey Mouse? Daisy Duck? Goofy? Pluto? You think you can see them, right? You see that? 
Gus or this guy? Gus Goops. Gus Goops, who kind of was eliminated a little after that. He was a slob. He ate all his food, went all over the place. But he was Donald Duck's cousin. Goose and Duck, but they didn't be cousins, but they are. Uh, but the first cartoon was uh, Donald's Cousin Gus, aired on May 19. First movie cartoon ever seen on TV. First baseball games, uh, August 26, doubleheader between the Brooklyn Dodgers and the Cincinnati Reds, Evans Field, Brooklyn. Let's cover my football book, and uh, poor old Beanie Feathers, he's getting, uh, must have hurt as they tackle him. Uh, that's a game between the Brooklyn Dodgers and the Pittsburgh Pirates in uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, but the first game was uh, October 22nd on TV, the Brooklyn Dodgers and Philadelphia Eagles, and there was about 1,000 TVs. Uh, in the New York area that could pick up that game. Uh, Gone with the Wind. Maybe you like the movie. Gone with the Wind. Like it. Gone with the Wind came out in 1939. Uh, it was adapted from a novel by Margaret Mitchell in 1936, set in the American South against the backdrop of the American Civil War and Reconstruction. It tells uh, the story of Scarlett O'Hara, the daughter of a Georgia plantation owner, following a romantic pursuit of Ashley Wilkes, who's married to his cousin, Melanie Hamilton, and her subsequent marriage to Brett Butler. Frankly, I don't give a damn. But uh, you might have, people in 1939 may have probably missed the story because there were demonstrations against the movie. You'd be sweet too under a whip. God with the wind hangs the free Negro. The film was criticized by black commentators and uh, its description of black people and whitewashing the issue of slavery. But initially, white news, uh, newspapers controlled by white Americans like Randolph Hearst didn't report on the criticisms or the protests against the movie. Hetty McDaniel was in the movie. She was with an Academy Award for her role in the movie, but she could not see the opening of the movie in Atlanta on December 15th at the Lowe's Grand Theater because of Georgia segregation laws or Jim Crow. Marian Anderson, everybody here know who Marian Anderson is? She was a great singer. She was a great singer. Uh, anyway, here she is in front of the Lincoln Memorial. Easter Sunday, April 9th. Easter Sunday the other day was April 9th. Uh, so it was 84 years to the day. She gave a free concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial after being denied the opportunity to perform at Washington's Constitutional Hall. Why? She was African American. Uh, in Constitutional Hall and the whites are this only policy. The daughters of the American Revolution who ran the hall said the rules governing the use of Constitutional Hall are in accordance with the policy of theaters, auditoriums, hotels, and public schools of the District of Columbia. No concert. That didn't make Eleanor Roosevelt all too happy, and she decided she was going to do something about it. Uh, she had a newspaper column, the First Lady of the United States, called My Day. And uh, she said in the column, I'm out of here, no longer a member of the Tourists of the American Revolution because your segregationist stance sickens me. Anderson and the Sporta said, well, you know what? We may not be able to get in there, but we'll give a concert outside. But a grander idea emerges. Uh, endorsed by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and her manager, uh, Saul Europe. She would sing in front of the Lincoln Memorial if it could be arranged, except there's a problem because it's federal land. And she has to clear it with that guy. Harold Aikens, the uh, head of the Secretary of the Interior. Uh, okay, he says, yeah, we could do it, except I gotta talk to my boss about this, FDR, Franklin Roosevelt. Now Franklin Roosevelt uh, tried to avoid matters of, of, of racial interest. Uh, after all, he needed the South to be reelected in Jim Crow country. But he gave his endorsement to this, and she said, she is. April 9th, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, 75,000 people are listening to her. She sang America and Ava Maria and a few black spirituals and told the audience, I'm so overwhelmed today, I cannot express myself. 
you don't know what you've done. We're off to see the Wizard of the Wonderful Wizard of Oz. How many of you like that movie? The Wizard of Oz. Do you need an imagination for this movie? You kind of need an imagination, right? Because the Tin Man can't talk. Cowardly Lion can't talk. Scarecrow can't talk, right? That's what they want. Well, when it came out, it was a bomb at the box office. It lost money. Critics hated it. Uh, the New Yorker, no trace of imagination, good taste, or integrity. New, uh, the New Republic, freak characters. Judy Garland would win an Oscar. So would the songwriters, Jim Hartberg and Harold Arlen, somewhere over the rainbow. Uh, Jim Hartberg, uh, among the things he did, is one of my favorite songs of all time, Brother Can You Spare a Die? Uh, and Harold Arlen, by the way, Paul McCartney owns their music today, and he's entrusted with their music. Uh, Lou Gehrig says goodbye on July 4th, 1939, gives that speech, or did he give that speech? For the past two weeks, you've been reading about a bad break, yet today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. That is the USS Arizona as I was walking into the memorial in uh, Pearl Harbor. The Winter War, Soviets and the Finns ended in March of 1940, and the Soviets got 90% of the territory. Japan attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. U.S. declared war on Japan the next day. Hitler and Mussolini declared war in the United States December 11, 1941. Hitler and Mussolini. And in 2018, the Russians, after years and decades of uh, looking at Adolf Hitler's remains, said he killed himself on April 30th, 1945. Uh, April 28th, 1945, Il Duce, Benito Mussolini, and his mistress, Clara Pataki, were shot by Italian partisans who captured the couple as they attempted to flee to Switzerland. This was an exhibit in Lower Manhattan about five years ago. And if you go through these doors, they ask you, what happened to the Nazis? 2021. Survey said one in ten young Americans believe the Holocaust never happened. 23% thought it was a myth, or that the number of those killed had been exaggerated. In a 50 states survey of Americans aged between 18 and 39, 12% said they never heard the thought they heard the word Holocaust. In August 2022, the Keller Independent School District in Texas pulled Anne Frank's diary adaptation from their school bookshelves. Just happened the other day in Vero Beach, the local school board did the same thing in Florida. Oh, the book required reading in Germany. Uh, that is a museum outside of Dulles Airport, about 30 miles from Washington. It's a Smithsonian uh, museum, and they have all these neat planes in there, including that one, the Enola Gay, that dropped the bomb over Hiroshima. Uh, the uh, Einstein letter led to the formation of the Manhattan Project and development of American atomic bomb. Germans never got a bomb. Hiroshima, 140,000 people would ultimately die from the blast on August 6, 1945. Some immediately, some years and years later from the fallout, radioactive fallout. On uh, August 9, 1945, Nagasaki was bombed. Afterwards, Harry Truman issued his first affirmative command about the bomb. No more strikes without my express authorization. He never ordered the bomb to be dropped. That was a military decision. But he issued the order to stop dropping the bomb. There were more to come, if needed. Uh, that is St. Petersburg, Russia. Me and my wife uh, about 12 years ago, which you can't go there right uh, the end of World War II saw the relationship between the U.S. and the Soviet Union crumble. Cold War started in 1946. The term Iron Curtain, coined by Winston Churchill at a speech at a college in Missouri in 1946. Well, what happened to the Nazis? Well, 1,600 Nazis, Operation Paperclip, were brought to the United States to work on defense programs, space program, including Werner von Braun, the father of the U.S. space program. Uh, the Argentina president, Juan Perón, actively welcomed Nazis to his country. Nazis ended up around the world. The hunt for Nazis would become global and is still open today. Uh, that's the hammer and sickle. Hammer and sickle, Soviet Union. 
uh, that is in a uh, subway station, St. Petersburg, Russia. Soviet Union fell in 1991, lasted 74 years. The problems remained between the U.S. and Russia. Middle East problems, far from being solved, the Jewish state uh, was formed Israel in 1948, which led to the first of many Middle East wars. In fact, one starting about six hours after uh, the Israelis announced independence. China freed Japan would see a civil war, becoming communist country in 1949. Father Kaufman ended his radio career in May 1940. Two years later, the U.S. government considered charging Coughlin with violating the Espionage Act, publishing enemy propaganda and social justice. Father Coughlin was the originator of hate radio in America, and the man who hired him in Detroit, G.A. Richards, defended Coughlin in his fights to keep his radio station licenses, as Richard was Richards was accused of promoting anti-Semitism. Uh, again, this is Coughlin, this is 1940, peacetime draft, new step to dictatorship. Jews put pressure on Wilkins running against Roosevelt to hit at Father Coughlin. Uh, the Catholic Church hierarchy in Detroit told Coughlin, get off the radio, or you're going to be excommunicated. He stayed as the priest at the Shrine of the Little Flower until 1966 when he retired and died. 1979 of illness, 1968, he said, I could have continued. People would have supported me if I didn't have the heart left for my church had spoken. Cadiz, Spain. Uh, Franco hang, hung on to power until 1975 when he died. He rescued many Jews. And I met one of those Jews two weeks ago in Long Island. They fled Hamburg, went through Spain in transit to Cuba, and Franco led them through. Didn't stop. Uh, he rescued many Jews. How many? 30,000? 60,000? 45,000? No one seems to know, but I finally met a woman who was saved by Francisco Franco, which goes to the meeting a woman who was saved by Raoul Wallenberg uh, during World War II. Right? Two things, and I learned that by giving talks. Franco didn't recognize Israel's statehood. He had a strong relation with uh, the Arab world. Yet, on December 16, 1968, the Spanish government formally revoked the 1492 edict of expulsion against Spain's Jewish population. And Saturday Night Live did a joke, a gag, a gag generalismo, Francisco Franco is still dead. The gag lasted two years. No Nazis, that's the former East Germany, and that's me in front of the side saying Nazis not allowed. Uh, the Allies split Germany into two after World War II. The Americans, Brits, and France ran West Germany and West Berlin, while East Germany became a Soviet client state. On October 3rd, 1990, East and West Germany reunited after 45 years. After the war, the Allies occupied West Germany Outlawed the Nazi party, worked to purge its influence from every aspect of German life. West Germany and now Germany have strict laws on banning political parties. Only two have been outlawed since the defeat of the Nazis at the end of World War II. The Neo-Nazi Socialist Right Party in 1952 and the German Communist Party in 1956. Karl Gable. Uh, in 2020, Warner Media removed Gone with the Wind from its streaming platform, HBO Max, for two weeks. HBO Max said the 1939 film was a product of its time and depicted ethnic and racial prejudices that were wrong then and wrong today. When the movie returned to the platform, a disclaimer video introduction discussed the movie's history and put it into context with its 1939 and 40 entertainment. It's more than they've done for 11 banned Warner Brothers cartoons. I guess the cartoons don't sell. Uh, Gone with the Wind does. When Henry McDaniel took the stage at the 12th Academy Awards in 1940, she was the only black woman in the room at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. That was the place where Bobby Kennedy was shot. It was a segregated hotel. She left the room with an Oscar for the Best Supporting Actress. Um, 1963, March on Washington, Jobs for Freedom, Marian Anderson is there. 
January 20th, 1957, she sings at Dwight Eisenhower's inaugural. She does the same for John Kennedy in 1961. She was active in supporting the Civil Rights Movement during the 1960s. She's back in front of the Lincoln Memorial in 1963. She sang at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, where Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech. Uh, it's a beloved movie now. It languished until 1956. Then The Wizard of Oz is on TV, became an annual affair, and it became a much beloved movie. Must see TV. Television changed people's lives. Entertainment is now in the living room. Avery Brundage became the uh, International Olympic Committee president in 1952. 1972, after the memorial service following the murder of 11 Israeli athletes and coaches by terrorists at the Munich Summer Olympics, Brundage decried the politicalization of sports and refused uh, to cancel the remainder of those Olympics, saying the games must go on. Now, he did acknowledge what happened. 27 words. 27 words in a talk that lasted more than a year. Uh, and Lou Gehrig, we end with Lou Gehrig, and that, that uh, is Lou Gehrig, or is that Gary Cooper? Lou Gehrig died in 1941 from ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, but really, did he have ALS? Nobody knows. Uh, maybe it was from the head injuries he suffered while he was playing football at Columbia University. Maybe, nobody knows, and it's too late all these years later. But we do know that he was honored on July 4th, 1939, there was a big group, and uh, down here are newspaper reporters and newspaper photographers, and I'll point that out for a reason. Newsreels recorded Gehrig's words that day, but didn't preserve them. They burned the uh, video or used it again in the film. Only four lines from the speech have survived. No official version exists. Not one newspaper person there, they're journalists. They are supposed to record things, right? They're supposed to write things down. Not one newspaper man transcribed it. The speech lived on through a performance by Gary Cooper in the 1942 movie, Pride of the Angels. Thank you so much. Any questions, any comments? It's your turn to talk. Now find the way.